for the next six months, let's just look at the next six or nine months, you know, the rest of 2019. My goal for this year to build a house that I can live in, to work on water storage for catching rainwater, I am very likely going to build, I want to build a windmill to make, um, to make electricity from the wind. I've got a book about that already. The first couple times I read the book, after reading it and looking at how much wind I have out here, I got excited and terrified at the same time. Hello and welcome to, um, well, Carlin's Worlds. Yeah, that should work. I'm a wanderer, a tinkerer, sometimes a nomad, a military veteran. I do things differently. There will be tinkering. I have a motorcycle, a truck, and a school bus. I live off-grid, so there will be some solar, batteries, inverters, and maybe even some wind. It blows. And that's all I can fit into about 30 seconds. Oh, and please, if you like any of this, it would be really awesome if you could subscribe and click that notify bell. Drop a comment if you have any questions or ideas. Share, like, comment, subscribe, notify. Oh, and Patreon if you're really an awesome kind of person. Cool, on with the show already. All right, so it's Wednesday, March 27th, 2019. Been back on the ranch for a few days now. Um, first couple days was just somewhere between slacker mode and trying to get used to being back out here again. It was kind of, kind of a weird feeling. I spent almost three weeks in the truck driving which was almost constant motion, you know, so that's completely the opposite of being out here. So I found the first couple days on the ranch, like the first night, oh man, I didn't sleep very good at all because nothing was moving. It was just so creepy and eerie and quiet, which is normally good. It's, it's getting back to normal again now, but first couple days was rough. Some of what's going on, I guess. I'm not looking for work yet. I got a few projects out here that I think if I can just get on them, I can knock them out and then my whole life will be entirely better. So I'm gonna focus on doing a few things out here first. Eventually, I am gonna to have to probably go get back another job. Short term, I don't have to work right away. Uh, when I left the postal service, I cashed out my vacation time. <laughs> that was kind of a mess. I had expected that they would direct deposit that money because for the last five years of working for the Postal Service, every payday, twice a month, money just appeared magically in my bank account. I'm out in Dallas in training. I'm like, okay, here goes, here's my next paycheck. Finally, two weeks later when the next check should have came in, because they paid every two weeks, still no, you know, no big money. I'm like, all right, what's going on? So I send a text message to my former supervisor. She's like, oh, yeah, well, the check got mailed to the office. So she went ahead and forwarded it to, it actually got mailed to my work office, not where my mail is delivered to, but to the postmaster. And I'm like, what? Why on earth would they do that? Okay. So she went ahead and forwarded it to my mailing address, at least. So I'm like, okay, that's good. So at least I know it'll be there when I get there. So in my mind, I've got all this money waiting. And uh, so when I finally decided the truck driving wasn't really the career path that I wanted to be on, I'm like, well, okay, I'm gonna go home and I know that money will be there. So I get to the post office and I've got, you know, a whole stack of mail. And uh, I've got, man, probably eight or ten different things from the Postal Service. And I'm going through them, and here's the check. And it was like $5,200. That's half of what I expected. And I'm like, what? So, next day I take it to the bank and get it deposited. So at least I've got that. Now, my plan has been to pay off a section of land that I'm living on. Okay. The way it works out, 
I'm on 80 acres, that is four 20 acre parcels. I've already talked to the people I'm buying the land from, and they say yes, what you can do, if you want to pay off one entire parcel, at that moment they'll just look at what your total balance is. So I've got four parcels, so I could pay off one quarter of it, and then they will give me the deed to that parcel. All right, so then I'll have one parcel paid free and clear. So the plan has been when I get that money, I will pay off first the piece of land that I'm actually parked on so that if something happens and you know everything else falls apart, I own this piece of land and they can't take it back. Okay, so that's that's been my, my kind of plan for a while now. Well, the money that I got so far is half of what I needed to do that first parcel. But after reading the rest of the mail that I got, you know, that was waiting for me, I see all the information so I could backtrack and figure out what they paid me. And they did, in fact, pay me the correct amount. So I was like, okay, at least I know that's, that, that part was right. I thought they had made a mistake at first. The check I got was for unused vacation time. Also, I am eligible to get back retirement money that I paid in. So between what they've already given me and what the retirement money will be, I will have enough to pay off the first 20 acres. Uh, I don't have to work for a month or two. Uh, if I was really careful, I could probably stretch out what I've got for five or six months even. I can pay off the first 20 acres and I think I can pay off the second 20 acres, which would mean, you know, then my land is half paid for. That's huge. At first, I thought it was going to be automatic because, you know, that would just make sense, you know. But that's the government, so what are you going to do? In my world, I would have just thought, okay, I only work for the Postal Service. Just give me all the money back. No, i got to talk to all these different people. So it's all forms, and, you know, I'll fill out the form, print it out, get it notarized, mail it in six to eight weeks later. Boom, more money. Okay, so that part's good. You know, that's, from what I can see, you know, you don't count your eggs until they hatch, but this should be a pretty straightforward thing. All right. Um, projects that I'm working on out here, I, I kind of accidentally overwhelmed myself. Um, so I had this list of things I want to do. One, I started drawing up, here's my, my official, you know, diagram. I need more room to do anything, you know, as far as living space. I've got, I've got plenty of room out here, but everything is still mostly in the bus. What I'm, I'm looking at is if I built a tiny home next to the bus that I can sleep in, move my kitchen in there, uh, and then the back half of it could be storage that you know, three quarters of my stuff is still in totes on shelves. So if I could pull that out of here, out of the bus, put it in the tiny home, then I'd have a insulated house to live in. And this is something I really got my head around the last winter in the bus is everything I want to do in the bus is more difficult because it's in the bus, right? But what I'm looking at is kind of what you would consider I've heard it called a shotgun house. It's not going to be a tiny home per se by definition because the tiny home is built on a trailer so that it can be moved. It's not considered a permanent structure is the idea. So the dimensions that I came up with, um, 8 feet wide and probably 24 feet long. And of that, the front half-ish will be what I live in and the back half will be storage. And so just shelves on both sides. And then by doing it that way, it's going to be eight feet wide, which is almost exactly the same width as the bus. It's going to be shorter than the bus is. Um, but if I look at what I'm actually living in in here, I'm only living in the first 15 or so feet of the bus anyway, and the back half is storage. Okay. So what I kind of came up with, I, you know, I could do it any size I wanted. It's, it's not a big deal, but if it's smaller, it's easier to keep it warm in the winter. Okay. Just 
kind of the way I was looking at it. Also from the spaceship project, um, my Mars story was based around multiple equal size capsules. It was kind of a, a recurring theme. And so when I was kind of looking at how big do I want to do it, I thought, well, okay, it kind of makes sense if it's the same size as the school bus. What I'm looking at is I'm going to, my sleeping and cooking and breakfast and shower is going to be in the house because it's easier to do wiring and plumbing when you're building the house. All right. Then, so that'll get the bed out of here. That'll open up a bunch of space. Um, I'm going to leave the washer and dryer in here and kind of move things around a little bit. But, and the shower that's in here is going to get redone over there. I'm going to make a proper shower this time. I'm kind of excited about that. So by moving half of the stuff out of the bus, then I'll create an open space in here, get the house finished, live in the house, get that all wired and insulated and, you know, done up nice. No, I don't know about nice, but at least finished. Then I can put energy into um, then doing sort of a bus conversion, but I'm going to use the bus then for just my office space. So I'll have my computers in here. I'll have my, my drawing desk will stay in here. Um, move some shelves around probably set up the back half of the bus for what I'm calling my tinker space so if I want to you know solder something or build something small I can do it in here eventually I'm still going to build a shop kind of that way somewhere but it's not as uh, high of a priority right now but my plan is if I can get the house built and you know before summertime and have it finished then my quality of life should get a little bit better because I've got a better place to live. It should be cooler in the summer because it's insulated. The bus, it's never been comfortable. It's always too hot. It's always too cold. Um, it's it's a hard it's a hard thing to live with because you can't really easily do the things you need to do. Plus, it's difficult because I've got everything in here. This has been the biggest. I don't know if I'd call it a mistake, but it's been the biggest challenge because from day one I've always had everything in the bus. And to do anything I have to take a bunch of stuff out, put it outside in the sand, do what I'm trying to do, and then by the end of the day bring it back in again. So by building an empty structure outside, finishing it, and then moving into it, I can stay in the bus until the house is finished and then move into the house. That'll take care of that half of, you know, the life cycle, basically. And then I can have an open space in here. Maybe then um, do a more traditional bus conversion. Um, possibly replace a few more windows. Uh, put up fur strips and insulation and a proper wall. You know, that kind of a thing. Things that I just couldn't do because I didn't have room to do it. Okay. When I first got back, I was I talked a little bit about being overwhelmed because I had a whole shopping list of projects that I really wanted to get going. And I, I literally spun in circles for three days trying to figure out which one to do first. And it was just, you know, my brain, no, can't do it all. So I wanted to do the house first, but I didn't feel like I was ready to jump into it quite yet. I've seen some videos on how to make concrete water tanks. Uh, the first one I saw was I think shot in Cambodia. Some missionary kind of people went out and showed the locals how to use simple materials. And uh, it's a technique called ferro cement. So you use some rebar and some chicken wire and you hand form a tank so you don't make a mole or a forms. You don't use forms. So you just kind of make your hoops out of rebar, stand them up, wrap the chicken wire around it, tie it all together, and then you take, um, you modify your concrete mix so it's not quite as soupy, and it's closer to mortar 
right? So you hand form the mortar mix up against the the, uh, the wire, and uh, when it's done, and you know, once it's cured, it's strong enough to hold water. All right. So the idea looked pretty simple. So I'm going to make a couple smaller ones first. But my plan is to hand build this concrete tank, and that'll be to hold the rainwater. So after I've built the small tanks next to the bus, prove that that works. Then I'll make a medium-sized tank, make one behind the bus on that manifold that I built. And if that works, and a big part of this is it's, it's time versus money and energy kind of a thing. So I already know that the IBC tank that I bought I think it was $350 for a little over 200 gallons, okay? That's more money because it comes with the cage and it's meant to be portable. Uh, <clears throat> I recently priced at Tractor Supply a 1,500 gallon tank for about $800. So, the, you know, I was kind of looking at in the beginning, it's about a dollar a gallon for trash cans is what I was, I kept seeing and a $30 trash can will cost you about $30. If you get a strong enough one, that'll actually hold water. The IBC was more than a dollar a gallon because of the cage, but it's a good solid tank and I knew it would work. But as you go up, it becomes less than a dollar a gallon, so the 1,500 gallon tank is seven or eight hundred dollars, depending on which one you get. Okay. So I'm keeping that in mind. So I'm going to build two or three smaller tanks first out of the concrete with the ferro cement process. One, see if it works. Two, is it a giant pain in the butt or is it something I can do and it's not, you know, I'm not going to say I'm going to enjoy it, but is it at least something I want to do a few of, you know, or should I just go back to tractor supply and buy a few tanks? Okay. Now I don't have infinite money and what I'm looking at is how much money am I getting from cashing out all of my accounts at the Postal Service? How long can I live on that? How much of my land can I pay off? You know, if I pay off 20 acres and then have some money left over, go buy a couple water tanks, that makes my life better out here because if I can catch rainwater, then I don't have to drive into town so much to get drinking water, shower water, laundry water. So last summer I did laundry and showers two or three months off of rainwater, okay? And the amount of water that hits me out here, if I could catch, you know, 1% of the water that hits this property, I would never have to haul water again, okay? So when I'm looking at building the tiny house, that's going to nearly double my roof capacity so that's how much water I can catch. Um, I'm also probably going to build a roof on top of the bus and I'm going to extend it a little bit out past the bus which will mean I catch more water off of that. Okay. Um, the roof on the bus was, is just to give me some shade. It's going to make it cooler in the bus. I don't need a roof on the bus but it'll make it cooler. So that's worth doing. And if I can make it catch more water that's a bonus. Okay. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. Um, so as far as building the concrete tanks, if I build one or two, it turns out to be a giant pain in the butt. And I can't make it hold water. It's, you know, okay, I'm just going to abandon that project. On the other hand, if it turns out to work really well, and if my cost per gallon is less than what I can buy a plastic tank for, then I'm going to go back and build more concrete tanks. Priorities, because it's springtime, um, in fact, it rained a little bit last night. I heard it on the roof. Um, <clears throat> monsoon is a couple months away yet. But if I can get that big tank that I'm digging now finished, that's the biggest priority right now. Okay, I may still buy a 1,500-gallon tank just to have safe water storage I guess and that it probably won't leak you know I don't want to have a thousand gallons of water sitting there and then find out I got a crack in the tank and then I lose it all that would suck so I'll probably still buy one big polyurethane tank 
I'm making videos about what I'm doing. You know, a lot of things I'm doing probably aren't the best. A lot of things I'm doing are half-ass, quarter-ass, whatever. Right? Um, there's there's a lot of choices I make out here based on either what I what I know, what I think I know, or because I don't know. Yeah, there's a good way to look at it, right? Since coming out here. My plan was never to live in the bus long term. The bus was an easy solution to a problem. I needed something safe to live in, up off the ground, not likely to blow over in the wind. And I wanted something big enough to live in and durable, right? I've worked with um, RV trailers before, and in my experience, they aren't very durable. So I wanted something that was stronger, and so I, I came back to school buses. I, I had known about school buses before. And, <clears throat> but there's there's compromises to the school bus. You know, and it's, it's hot in the summer, it's cold in the winter. The windows don't seal very well. You get a lot of dust blowing through, a lot of wind blowing through. It's not very comfortable, all right? So, I never put a lot of energy in the first year into doing the bus conversion because I always looked at the bus as being a temporary solution to a long-term problem. I probably would have tried harder if I would have realized when I first came out here that two years later I would still be living in the school bus, right? Um, in the first three months I was out here, I started drawing lines in the sand of where I wanted to build the house. And uh, <laughs> that first one was pretty funny because that's before I knew it rained out here. I just thought it was the desert. I didn't it didn't even cross my mind that it would rain. And uh, I remember one night looking out at the rain and the ground was flooding. And the place that I had drawn the lines in the sand for where I wanted to put the house was under about this much water. Now I wouldn't have built it right down on the ground, but the idea that I was about to build a house in a place that was completely flooded caused me to kind of back off and think about it a little bit more. So yeah, that's when I moved the bus a few feet further up the hill and I haven't had that problem since. I think after living out here for a couple of years though, I've got a little better idea of a little bit of it is like pain points, you know, you're like, what is the, what are the things that bother me the most out here, right? And how can I most easily solve them? Uh, in the bus, it's hot in the summer, it's cold in the winter, the wind is an issue. Um, when I stabilize the bus and put the skirts, in fact, I've never finished the skirts, but skirting the bus and putting the stabilizing stabilizing blocks under the bus have made it much much more comfortable in here the bus doesn't rock in the wind the floor is much warmer um, little things like that have taken a lot of the um, pain and frustration out of the equation so it's um, it's made it easier to stay in the bus right? the next biggest problem is space because I've got so much stuff in here. If I didn't have all of this stuff, this is a lot of room. And that's kind of why when I decided to um, look again at building a house, right now I'm looking at pretty much duplicating how much room I have in the bus next to the bus. Because if I can live in the house and get some of my stuff out of the bus, and then later when I build my workshop and get some of the other stuff out of the bus, now I've got a, enough livable space. You know, if, if I took tools out of the bus, that would give me about 15 feet in the back. That would be huge, right? So I don't need, you know, 3,000 square feet of house. You know, I need a workshop is what I need in a little tiny house. For the next six months, let's just look at the next six or nine months, you know, the rest of 2019. 
my goal for this year to build a house that I can live in, to work on water storage for catching rainwater. I am very likely going to build, I want to build a windmill to make, um, to make electricity from the wind. I've got a book about that already. The first couple times I read the book, after reading it and looking at how much wind I have out here, I got excited and terrified at the same time because the potential for how much power I can generate is enormous, but the wind is so strong, I was terrified because the idea of a spinning blade of death that I built, <laughs> I was like, oh no. <laughs> I put the book away for about a year. I'm like, I don't wanna build a windmill. I don't wanna build a windmill. <laughs> but, I've kind of come around again. I'm like, well, you know, if I follow the book, I think it'll be okay. And uh, we'll go from there. There was, I talked about this a little bit last year, geothermal heating. And it, there's a couple words that are confusing on that, so I'm not sure if I always have the right one. One form is using basically the heat from the earth, like geysers or volcanoes. There's places that have power plants that are taking the hot steam that comes out of the earth running a turbine generating electricity. That's not what I'm doing or what, what I'm looking at. The one I'm looking at is at 10 or 12 feet below the surface and I've seen anywhere from 6 feet to 12 or 20 feet. If you ran an air pipe underground or built a house underground because I've heard of guys doing bunkers. If you build a bunker, or if you've been in a cave, you go in a, in a cave in the heat of the summer and it's a constant 65 degrees. It's very comfortable in there. You go in that same cave in the winter when it's 40 below outside, it's still 65 degrees inside because the, the entire mass of the earth has stabilized when you get below the surface to be a constant temperature. So people have figured out that if you dig a trench in the ground and put a air pipe underground and then bury it again and then run a fan, you can put this air pipe in a long loop and have it constantly circulating and blow it back into your house. And the air coming out of that pipe will be pretty close to 65 degrees year round. So if it's 90 degrees in the summer, or 100 degrees, and you had this air pipe blowing into your house at 65, instead of running your air conditioner, which takes a lot of energy, you're just running a fan. Now, you need a fan that's pretty good size, kind of like what's on a furnace. So that might be a 10 or 15 amp fan. So that, that is still using some power, but it's considerably less than running an air conditioner, is the idea. Uh, so in the summer you can cool your house, in the winter you're warming your house. Now if it was, like for instance here in the bus, some mornings in the winter I wake up, it'll be 20 degrees Fahrenheit in here, inside the bus. Okay. Well if I had a fan running off of the batteries that were charged off of the solar system, that could run that fan and blow 65 degree air into the bus when it's 20 degrees, that would be a whole lot more comfortable. Okay. If it's above 40 degrees, I typically don't run the propane heat. You know, because I can wear a sweatshirt and sweatpants and maybe a toque and be comfortable. So I was looking at that. I'm like, okay, it's simple technology. It's a fan. You know, the hard part, and this comes back to digging the hole, is I would have to dig somewhere around 300 feet of trench to make this work. Okay. <clears throat> but you do it one time and you know once you buried the pipe it pretty much should last the rest of my life. I mean pipe is tends to just sit there, you know. There's there no moving parts, you know. I suppose, you know, water pipes in a city they do have to replace them once in a while, but you know 
my thought was, you know, you'd build it once and you'd probably be done. Okay. So, last year, I was pretty excited about that. And then I happened to see a video that completely changed how I looked at it. And I'm like, the idea is good. But I thought about, you know, maybe you could change it a little bit. So, let me back up a second. I've already talked about the water tank that I'm, I'm digging. That's going to be somewhere around 3,000 gallons, I think. Okay. How hard it is to dig here. Now, if I went out and rented, like, a ditch witch or a backhoe, I could do it. But it's, it's not trivial. It's incredibly hard digging. So I would be looking at an industrial size machine and transporting it 100 miles one way and you know, maybe a few days of digging. So it, this would be expensive, right? And it's on a scale that I really couldn't do it reasonably by hand because you need to dig down minimum six feet before it really starts to be effective. Okay, so this is a pretty sizable project. Well. I saw this video, and uh, I've, I've seen this guy, he's, I don't remember the guy's name anymore, but he's been doing uh, some solar, solar electric, he's buying batteries off of um, wrecked electric cars and making a battery bank and so on. Well, he, he had a, an interesting way of looking at it, he's like, you can take electricity from your solar panels and you store it in batteries and then you use that power in the batteries to power your house, whatever you're doing. And there's a pretty good relationship between how much money how much money you spend on the solar panels, how much money you spend on the batteries, and how much you get out of it. And eventually the batteries wear out, the solar panels wear out. Um, I've heard, you know, probably 10, 15 years on solar panels and you should replace them. Lead acid batteries, maybe three or four years, lithium batteries, probably longer but they're still pretty new so nobody really knows you know maybe you're because they're making the batteries for cars and you know they they should last at least five years in a car and you'll see numbers like maybe they have 80 percent of their capacity left after five years you know so instead of you know say if you had a hundred mile car you could drive a hundred miles at the end of five years, maybe you can get to 80 miles before you run out of power, something like that. Okay, so it's it's a, it's amazing technology, but it's still not perfect, like anything. Okay, something like running an electric water heater takes an enormous amount of power. I've got a little seven-gallon water heater that I use for taking showers. I don't have anywhere near enough battery capacity to even mess with running that off of solar right now. If I wanted to do that, it would be thousands of dollars probably. I'm going to say $5,000 worth of batteries and solar panels just to run a hot water heater. Okay. I could be off, but it's somewhere in that neighborhood. It's quite a bit. Summertime. I don't need to heat the water because it's 100 degrees in here. So uh, by the end of the day when I'm ready to take a shower, the water that I'm showering with is close to 100 degrees and it actually feels pretty good just to run quote unquote cold water out of the tap, take a shower, it cools you off a little bit and it feels okay. So I got about six months of the year where I really want to heat the water and six months where I don't have to heat the water. Uh, since I've been back, it's the end of March now, I'm still heating the water, but it's not taking as much to heat it. Like at the moment in the bus, according to my digital thermometer, it's 80 degrees right now. Okay. And it's uh, almost noon. Okay. So, <clears throat> what this guy in the video was talking about, he was like, well, instead of storing electricity in batteries, and then using that battery or directly from the solar panel to then run an electric water heater. You know, everybody can see this one coming. Why not just heat up water directly with the sun? Okay. And then either, you know, I've done, I've taken showers out of garden hoses that the hose was on the roof of the bus and it's incredibly warm. 
However, in the winter, the water is starting out too cold. So even though it does warm up during the day, it's not nearly warm enough to take a shower. Okay. So that part, it's not ideal. And the irony is in the summer, you don't need the hot water. In the winter, you don't have enough heat to have hot water. So this guy was talking about, and I've seen, and I've, I've started experimenting with these before. You make a solar water heater, uh, black pipe, coil it up, put it in an insulated box, put a glass cover on it so that the cold air doesn't get into it, pump water through there slowly, the water comes out warmer. The trick is you put that water coming out into an insulated tank like a water heater you know, even if you had it going into a water heater that's not turned on, the water heater is insulated, so it keeps it from getting too cold. That's the important part. So that by the time you're ready to take a shower, this water has heated and been stored and heated and you know, kind of loop it, such that your water heater is now up to 100, maybe 120 degrees. Now you've got enough hot water for a shower, okay? And overnight it doesn't get down to you know 20 degrees again because right now all of my water out in the tank it cools down overnight to being well I remember this last winter before I went to Dallas uh, I'd turn on the water switch and because uh, I got an electric pump I hit the switch open up the tap wash my hands off after using the bathroom and it was so cold, your hands hurt from washing your hands. You know, it's, it's, you know, 20 degrees. It's right, I mean, it's, sometimes I've had twice now that the water has frozen and you couldn't get water to come out, kind of thing. So when I say it's 20 degrees in here, the water in the tank has enough mass usually so that it doesn't get down to actually freezing, but twice it did freeze, kind of thing. So it's, it's right at freezing, okay, cold. So, if you could have a water tank that was insulated and a solar water heater and then cycle the water, it would heat from the sun and it wouldn't get as cold to the point that you could raise the temperature up. Okay. Well, I, I knew about the parts of that, but it didn't occur to me that that idea could replace the hot air pipes that I was going to have to bury under the ground. All right. So here's the, the cool part. Instead of digging a trench that's about 300 feet long, eight feet deep, to take advantage of the hot earth, or you know the warm or stable temperature of the earth, what if you had a thousand gallons of water and you bury that tank under the ground, insulate it and bury it so that the water is protected by the mass of the earth, so it stabilizes at a temperature. It's not exposed to the air, so the air can't cool it down. So what this guy did on the video, um, he had this tank under his house, and I think he, he felt that his tank wasn't big enough, so I think it was like 500 gallons. But he had insulated it, he dug it under the house, and then he put an insulated cover on it. So kind of think of it like a hot tub. Right? So about that size is what it seemed like. So he had this tank insulated under the ground, under the house, and he called that his thermal mass. Then he ran a coil of, he used PEX plastic plumbing pipe, uh, probably 100 feet long, set, put that coil into this other tank. That came from the solar collector outside. So the collector got hot, that hot water was pumped down through a loop, it exchanged its heat into this 500 gallons of water, he heats up that water. Now he was he had all these great formulas and I'll try to find this link later, I'm going to do another video about this I think, but the idea was is he, he figured okay water has you know, he was using BTUs and formulas and all kinds of neat math. So he figured, okay, a gallon of water has so many BTUs of energy, British thermal units. Okay, 
So the idea is you can hold this much water and it'll hold this much temperature. Okay. All of a sudden the light goes off in my head and I got to thinking about things like motorcycles and cars. Motorcycles used to be air cooled and then they got to a point where the air couldn't cool down the motor enough so they had to switch over to liquid cooling. They didn't want liquid cooling because you have to have a radiator, water pump, water hoses, water, you know. It made the motorcycle a lot more complicated. But they finally got to the point that they couldn't get enough horsepower without it overheating. And Porsche went through the same thing. For years, well, Porsche and Volkswagen were air-cooled. They finally got to the point where they got to the limit of what you could do with air cooling, and then they went liquid cooling. All right, but the 911s were air cooled up until in the 80s or 90s. I can't think when they exactly, but they they were doing like 400 horsepower with an air cooled motor, right? And then they finally got to the point. It's like okay, we've we've exhausted every possibility, and then they went to liquid cooled. <clears throat> so. The idea is liquid, like water, has more thermal mass, thermal capacity than air does. Okay, So in air, where we needed 300 feet of air lines under the ground to be able to absorb that 60 degree air and you know heat the cold air up to 65 degrees and pump it back into your house, 500 gallons of water can do about the same thing. And, you know, it's like this magical moment where the light just came on and it's like, that's the dream. It's like, I can dig a hole that'll hold 1,000 gallons a heck of a lot easier than I can dig a 300-foot trench. Yes. <laughs> so, that's going to be the one of the projects that I'm looking at this year. So, my list for the year, I'm going to finish my big water tank, learn about ferro cement tanks, build the little house, possibly a greenhouse because I want to be able to extend my food money a little bit so if I can grow something that I can eat and not have to drive into town to get food all the time, that's going to help a little bit. And then experimenting with how to heat water without a lot of money taking that heat, putting it into a tank in the ground such that I can then take a hot shower without needing my hot water heater. And this has to work in the cold weather. Okay. The next part of that is if I can scale that up and take hot water and run it through a heater core and a fan, like the big giant heater core I took out of the bus. So if I got hot water stored in the ground pump it through a heater core, turn on an electric fan, get heat in the bus that was solar heated in the daytime and heat the bus at night. Right? That's where it gets interesting. The whole idea on the solar water heater system, I'll say. Stage one, enough for a hot shower. Because I have over 300 days of sunshine a year, and including the winter, most days I should be able to get enough hot water out of this thing to take a shower. Okay, that's stage one. Stage two, anything extra, if I take my shower in the evening and I still have water left over, I can run that through the heater core and take the chill off the air overnight. If I wake up and it's 20, 20 degrees Fahrenheit, 20 above, that's pretty cold. If I can get that up to 40, I don't need propane heat. I don't run the propane heat when I'm sleeping. Um, so anything above that is, is comfortable. I can live with that. Okay. So if I can get to a point where I can store a few hundred gallons of 100 degree water overnight and slowly pump that into a heat exchanger, the radiator, heater core, it doesn't take very much power to run a small DC fan to blow air slowly through this thing. Um, what I'm looking at is something like an Arduino and sensors 
I can have a thermostat in here that says, okay, it's too cold, turn on the water pump, start pumping the water through the heat exchanger. Once that's warm, turn on the fan, start blowing air. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. It's not really complicated. Um, I'm thinking a couple hundred dollars worth of parts can make that work. Okay, so you got stage one, hot shower, stage two, warm up the bus or the house, same system. I'm going to be in the bus most of the time during the daytime as my office, and I'll be living in the house at night. The house will be much better insulated. So if I sit in here with a sweatshirt and the sun shining through the windows, I'm fine. Nighttime when I want to go to sleep, I crawl in the bed, pull my head under the covers, I'm still pretty comfortable. Okay. And because the house is better insulated, I don't need a lot of heat. That's the trick. Okay. So stage one shower, stage two heat. If I get to a point where I can generate more hot water than I need, what I'm looking at is wintertime. I can start dumping excess heat into the big tank. Okay, now if you just think, just simple math, BTUs, if I got 3,000 gallons of water there, that's going to take it a long time to warm up. But it's free heat at that point. Okay. So if I can cycle heat back and forth to wherever I, either where I need it or where I can store it, I can use that heat for something else. Now think about if I got... 3,000 gallons of water sitting at 50 degrees when it's 30 degrees outside. Okay. When I've got a greenhouse, I could start pulling 50 degree water into the greenhouse and raise it up. Because 5,000 gallons or 3,000 gallons of water at 20 degrees above ambient, that's enough BTUs to warm up the greenhouse. And it was sort of free because it was solar heated in the first place. So if in the daytime it's warm, you can heat up the water. Nighttime, you pull the heat from the water, it just sits there and cycles back and forth. You're not burning fuel to get that to work. You've got electricity for the pump, and you got direct solar heating of the water. Okay, Then it's just a matter of black pipes with the sun shining on them to warm it up. Now here's the fun part. I kind of dodged around this a while ago. I'm on 80 acres where I've got probably minimum two or three days a week of wind. Sometimes a lot of wind. Sometimes gale force wind. The kind of wind that blows your trash cans away. It's windy enough that I spent the time building wind breaks just to have a place to stand outside out of the wind. Okay, so it's it's pretty windy. Not every day though. But between three hundred days of sunshine and probably half the year, so 180 degrees, 180 days of wind. Think about how much potential energy I have on my property here. It's, it's staggering when you think about it. Okay. And this is the thing is, if I was living in a school bus driving around, I don't have that kind of surface area. I've got my roof and that's all I've got for solar. When I put the solar panels out there, it was just to make it easier so I didn't have to crawl up on the roof all the time. But I've got all of this area. Okay. <clears throat> so I got to thinking about it. I'm like, when you have a windmill, the problem is if your batteries are full and you don't have anything else to load, you basically can't take all of the energy the windmill can generate and then the windmill starts spinning faster and faster. If you have a heavy load on the windmill, the alternator or the generator on the windmill slows it down. If you disconnect the load on the windmill, it self-destructs because it spins super fast without a load. So you need a charge controller that's able to send the power to your battery bank, and then when the battery is full, it has to do something else with the load. So what a lot of people do is they take an old electric heater, set it outside somewhere, and then they have a resistance load on the windmill. So when you don't need the heat, you dump the excess electricity into this heater core or you know heater element that's just outside dumping heat into the air. Okay. That's a waste. Well, when I was thinking about it, and I'm sure this isn't an original idea, I've done a lot of reading over the years about this. Some of the people use the excess heat for heating water in their water heater. That's great. 
Well, then I got to thinking about it. Like, so I thought about the guy with his water tank under the house. And I was like, well, yeah, duh. Your windmill is generating surplus electricity. Run that through a heater element, like a water heater element, and submerge that into your water tank. So anytime the wind is blowing, you're dumping excess heat into your water tank. Now you've got more hot water for your shower, more hot water for heating your house. And then I went up a scale because I've got 80 acres that I'm not really using. And I started thinking about the potential energy that I have available out here. So let's say the wind only blew one day a week. It, it blows typically more than that. It blows a lot. And it blows at night. That's the interesting part. So anytime the wind is blowing, once my batteries are topped off and once my water tank for my shower is, say, hot enough, then I can divert energy into, so I, what I was thinking is a shower tank would be 100 gallons, maybe a 1,000 gallon water tank to heat the bus in the house or the greenhouse, and then so you get like 100 gallons, 1,000 gallons, and maybe 10,000 gallons, you know, just random numbers. Once I've got hot showers and enough heat to get me through the night comfortably, switch the load over to the heater element that's in the 10,000 gallon tank. Start bringing that one up, okay? Because you're wasting the electricity anyway, put it into a load that's worthwhile. You know, so wintertime maybe, you know, you could have a wind-powered heated hot tub. Or you could use that heat to bring up your greenhouse you know, so I was thinking a while ago if I had a greenhouse slash sunroom on the south side, wintertime I'd take my laptop out there, sit next to the plants and be warm. You know, the sun shining on you, the heat naturally coming from, you know, your water system in there, and, you know, maybe it's 60 degrees instead of 40 degrees. That would be nice. Okay. <clears throat> so I was just kind of, just I haven't done the math on the numbers, but... The book that I had on building the windmills, they they rated it conservatively at a thousand watts. Okay. And this was a fairly good sized windmill. And they showed, you know, this is like you hand wind the wires for the, um, the rotors and you buy the magnets and you make your blades, uh, hand carve them. And they showed the whole process and they're like, in a typically windy environment, they were like, this is so underrated, it'll put out well over a thousand watts. But it's not a thousand watts continuously because the wind blows and then it stops and it gusts and it stops. You know, so you just say, okay, you're gonna average somewhere around 800 to a thousand watts and then you're, you're not disappointed, right? Well, I got to thinking about it. By the time you take the time to build one windmill, you kind of know how to do it. And I was looking around, I'm like, well, I got plenty of room out here. You know, you could build a bunch of windmills if you wanted to. So, anyway, that's that's kind of a, one of the things that I'm looking at, because I, I started talking about the air pipes and the geothermal heating. Well, if you take the element of that of storing excess heat, and you sw switch it around instead of it being air pipes and you put it into a tank of water and you take the sun shining on the black pipes and you take the wind blowing on the windmill as two different ways of generating heat and you dump it into a big, big tank of water and then it's just like your bank account you put in heat when you can and you take out heat when you need it and then you kind of get to the summertime and you got too much heat in the bus and I'm like all right that same tank that's at 60 degrees you do the same thing you start pumping 60 degree water into your heater core and you blow a fan through it and you're transferring heat from the bus into that tank and you're getting cold air coming out of it and I was like, okay, so if you had, say, if it's 100 degrees in the bus and you had 60 degree water, that's going to feel pretty good, right? 
And so all summer long, you could be dumping excess heat from your air into that water tank, slowly rising the temperature of the water tank and slowly, you know, pulling your air temperature down. So by the end of summer, maybe you've increased the temperature on 10,000 gallons by five degrees, but you've cooled yourself down. And then that excess heat is now warming you up in the wintertime. Huh, that's kind of cool. Yeah. That's, uh, when I'm looking at that, instead of digging 300 feet of trench, I'm digging a water tank. Instead of needing 300 feet of air pipe, I need maybe a couple hundred feet of half inch, three quarter inch, one inch PEX, copper pipe even. It seems a lot simpler. I could put that water tank right next to where the house is. So I'm thinking, okay, I'll have a hundred gallon tank, that's my showers, maybe a thousand gallon tank next to the house in the ground, and then the three thousand gallon tank that I'm already digging, I could run excess heat into that. That seems kind of cool. Yeah. So that's kind of the, the plan for this year. We'll come back at the end of the year and see if anything happened, right? Anyway, um, it's noon now. I'm getting hungry. I got stuff I was supposed to do today, and I'm losing my voice, so I'm going to wrap it up for there. Anyway, yeah, if you like the video, go ahead and click a like. If you have any questions or ideas or comments, go ahead and drop them in the comments below. To all the new subscribers, um, thanks for joining. If you haven't yet subscribed, go ahead and click on that subscribe button, and um, stay tuned for the next one. Thanks. Bye for now. Well, that's about it. Thank you so much for watching. Yeah, that should work. Cool. I do things differently. Oh, and please, if you like any of this, it would be really awesome if you could subscribe and click that notify bell. Drop a comment if you have any questions or ideas. Share, like, comment, subscribe, notify. Oh, and Patreon if you're really an awesome kind of person. Thank you so much for watching.